<laughs> We're live. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Katie Talbot. I'm the organizer with Neighbor to Neighbor in Holyoke. Um, and you are joining us tonight. Um, we've got a great evening um, of some great speakers and panelists. Um, so we're going to give it just another minute for folks to join us and then we'll get started. Anyone that's joining us, if you want to throw um, your name, where you're from, your pronouns in the chat so we know who's here with us, um, feel free to do that. Awesome. This feels about right. We ready to roll, y'all? Um, so again, thanks, thanks for joining us. Um, We've got a ton of information to share with you folks, and uh, we're really glad you could join us. Um, yeah, this uh, this past fall, the Election Protection um, Coalition uh, was statewide. We got together to, to protect the access to ballots um, behind bars. Uh, the goal was to protect and promote um, eligible voters to be able to have access to those ballots. Uh, currently in Massachusetts, uh, residents serving felony sen sentences are ineligible to vote. Um, but, you know, wink, wink, that should change over the next few years. Um, but pretrial and civilly committed folks um, and those being held on misdemeanor sentences um, are eligible to vote. Um, and we wanted to make sure uh, statewide that that was possible this year. It was a big election, as every election is. Um, and um, we were committed um, to make that happen. We work with sheriff's departments, um, trying to hold them accountable and, and uh, city clerks, and, and we'll dive a little more into all the nitty gritty of what that looked like this fall. Um, so thanks again for joining us. Um, our first speaker tonight is Nicole Porter, uh, who is the advocacy director, or excuse me, the director of advocacy with the Sentencing Project. Um, if Y'all don't know the Sentencing Project's been around for about 34 years. Um, they really are amazing at shining light on, on this broken system and the, and the racial disparities um, and the history of mass incarceration. Um, the Sentencing Project is on the front line of pushing for advocacy and reform. And I, I know I'm super stoked to hear a little from Nicole. So, so um, Nicole, welcome. Thank you so much, Katie. It's an honor to join you all. So, you know, this year is a big year for voting rights and focusing on voting rights in particular. At the Sentencing Project, um, you know, I put out a report earlier this year on voting in jails, and that helped power a conversation around jail-based voting efforts that Christina and others from Massachusetts participated in. And I would say that the Massachusetts Coalition is definitely a model in terms of the way that um, folks in Massachusetts collaborated to guarantee voting rights for people in jail who might be de otherwise de facto disenfranchised because of the lack of guarantees um, around voter participation in access to the ballot. So that report that we put out is called Voting in Jails, and you can find it online at sentencingproject.org. But specifically, nationally, there were over 5 million people who were disenfranchised with the felony conviction. That includes about 70, around 745,000 individuals who are incarcerated in jails on any given day. And many of those folks are de facto disenfranchised because of the lack of access to the ballot just because they're an afterthought or not considered at all. So certainly the community coalition that helped anchor that conversation in Massachusetts is critical. Next year, hopefully we can codify some of those practices through a state strategy in Massachusetts that I think can help inform additional state conversations in other parts of the country. And certainly the fight never stops, right, in, in terms of a guaranteeing access to the ballot for anyone who may be incarcerated in jail. And so jail-based voter registration efforts and then also ballot access coming up on any future elections will be critical. And the sentencing project wants to support the state coalition in advancing that. Also, you know, as I wrap up my comments, the work around universal suffrage and expanding the franchise for people with felony convictions 
is a movement that is sort of the next area for reform nationally. I live in D.C. This year we expanded the franchise to people with felony convictions who are in prison and jail and hope that that is an area that we can work with others on, including you all in Massachusetts. So I'm ready. I'm, I'm so excited about the folks, you know, who are on this webinar and the folks in Massachusetts who help lead this work coming up to this November election and who will continue this work going into 2021. So, you know, stay connected with the Sentencing Project. Know that you can find that report I mentioned at sentencingproject.org and know that a next step for us is to expand the franchise to people in prison with the felony conviction. So thank you again, Christina, for inviting me to participate and look forward to taking next steps and collaborating with you all. Thanks, Nicole. Um, thanks for all the, the hard work that uh, Sentencing Project is doing. You know, um, it sucks that we need organizations like this, but I'm super grateful y'all exist and, and you're really pushing push in um, the work that needs to get done. So thank you and, and thanks for joining with us tonight. Um, yeah, Christina Mesnick is, is gonna tell us a little bit um, now. Christina's with the Common Cause here in Massachusetts um, and who um, was super, super active in the uh, election protections uh, coalition um, this fall. She's gonna give us a little insight into to what we learned, what we saw um, over the last few months. So Christina. Awesome, thank you, Katie. Um, and, and thank you so much, Nicole, for your insight and leadership at the Sentencing Project. Um, I'm really pumped to, uh, to also be on this Zoom with you all tonight. And I wanna uh, make sure we have lots of time for the panel. Um, um, but I also just wanna to thank those folks who are um, who have really led the fight in Massachusetts on democracy and incarceration issues. And those are incarcerated people um, in our Commonwealth, whether it's those folks who did voter registration drives or organized a political action committee in the 70s and 80s. Um, uh, uh, folks on the other side of the wall have really been at, at the front of this fight. Um, uh, in Massachusetts, people who, who did some of that civic organizing work were actually punished in 2000 when the right to vote for those ser serving felony convictions was taken away. Um, and then it was incarcerated people who picked the fight back up to try and push against that and, and to strengthen ballot access for those folks in our Commonwealth who maintain the right to vote um, even after 2000. Um, it's really on that foundation uh, and, and with that leadership and exactly Derek Washington Emancipation Initiative that our coalition this fall has been able to do anything that we've been able to do um, uh, you know, I, it, it's been a long year. And so I, I want to try and celebrate some of the good things. Um, we were able to get the Secretary of Commonwealth to issue guidance that should mean um, fewer absentee ballot applications from incarcerated people are rejected. There were a number of other things too, but I think the most kind of heartening piece of this fall for me was just seeing the groundswell of support in Massachusetts on this issue and nationally. Um, I think that what we see happening is, is kind of a fundamental understanding shift that folks get that, that, that the ability of people who maintain the right to vote to cast a ballot and then expanding the right to vote so that our most governed population can be represented um, is just a fundamental democracy issue. This is not some niche, um, niche issue. Um, before passing it back to the panel, um, I wanna just touch on, I think, three quick things that are unfortunately about our least favorite subject, which is COVID. Um, um, for this work, the pandemic has meant three things. Once, once again, um, we just see, you know, another blight get added to the list of problems that disproportionately impact communities of color in Massachusetts. Um, and that has just been a reminder to us all that we need to center racial equity work in everything that we do and especially democracy work. Um, the second thing has, is, is that for uh, uh, incarcerated people, uh, COVID has meant basically being sentenced, um, sentenced to die. I don't think that's an overstatement. We've seen how the pandemic has ravaged uh, incarcerated people. And uh, in the face of inaction, um, that's, that's just really what it's meant. Um, there are so many things that are wrong with that, that I'm not, you know, going to even get into, but I just, throughout this fall, I, I, 
um, kept on asking myself who else, um, who is more deserving and needing of the right to vote than not only those folks who are most, our most governed population, but those folks whose lives are literally in the hands of government. Um, the last thing that has come up with COVID is that as we try and do this work, we have had sheriffs tell us that this year is not the year essentially for voting for incarcerated people because the pandemic means that volunteers don't have access to jails. In years past, um, folks from Emancipation Initiative, the League, um, Pastor Hobbs also this year have had access to jails where they go in and actually bring people absentee ballot applications, make sure that eligible voters know about deadlines, all that, all of those just basic things. And it really troubled me that we have, <laughs> we have sheriffs telling us that the problem with the, the problem is that voters or uh, volunteers don't have access to jails. To me, um, the problem is that we have a system of voting for incarcerated people that re relies on volunteers to do those basic things. Um, so that's the problem, that our system of voting doubles as a system of, of, of systematic disenfranchisement. Um, I feel like our coalition has learned a whole lot. Um, I'm really excited to, to push the needle forward with legislation uh, next year and a whole lot more. Um, but I think with that, I will pass it back to uh, Katie and, and I'm excited to, to, to listen in on the panelists. Thanks, Christina. Thanks for all the hard work this fall and, and um, highlighting some of the things that we learned. Um, yeah, I'm really excited for our panelists. Um, we've got uh, Justin H. And I, you know, I can't say your name, Justin. I'm sorry. I love you though. Um, who works with Great Falls, Book Behind Bars, um, is a board member with Neighbor to Neighbor, and has really been active in decarcerate Western Mass. Um, Sean Ellis, who is a previously incarcerated individual who's become an activist um, in the last few years, um, and Pastor Franklin Hobbs, who is part of Doing Our Land, as well as the host of Boston Praise TV and radio. Um, so thanks, y'all. I don't know if you want to take a minute to just say hi and check in, and then we can get to some questions. No, you're good. You're good. We, uh, uh, hey. All right. I'm very honored to be on the panel. <clears throat> hey, Justin. All right. Well, I'll just dive right in, y'all. Um, <clears throat> so, as a, I'm a previously incarcerated woman, and um, for me, voting um, has been empowering, and access to to voting and um, has just been something that part of my process of healing has, has been really empowering. And, and Sean, I'd like to start with you, if you don't mind, and, and really find out what where voting has played in, in your um, coming back into the community, and then just get a little bit of insight of, of while you were incarcerated, what was um, talked about about voting, what access you had as, um, for voting. Um, yeah, if you wanna just tell us a little bit about your experience around um, your voting and what it means to you. Thank you, Katie, and, and welcome to everybody in attendance. Um, so while I was incarcerated um, for, for the 22 years um, that I spent in prison um, for a crime that I didn't commit, um, I, I didn't hear, as the years went on, I didn't hear much about voting. Um, I, was, I, I was sentenced uh, to life imprisonment in 1995. And around that time, I think that was around a time where voting was just getting like out of the system. Um, and so, you know, I, I recall hearing some rumblings um, about, you know, people wanting to vote, not being able to vote. Um, and then what I noticed is that as the years continue to happen, uh, the, the attention that was being paid um, to those who are incarcerated became less and less. Um, and so there was a separation um, between the prison population and those and, and those in government. And um, that allowed for more of a, a repressive, if you will, sort of environment, environment within the prison. Um, and that was because if I wanted to read and, 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 and educate, 
myself in a particular way. Um, but but the 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 uh, the commissioner who is appointed um, by an elected official, you know, his prison philosophy was more geared towards punish uh, punishment rather than rehabilitation. Then then he's pushing that ideology is pushing that con condition on down to the system. And, and so, you know, it's important for the prison population to stay connected to elect the elect elected officials. Thank you, Sean. Um, now, now that you've been out for a few years and um, uh, participating in the voting process, what, is, what has that meant for you? What has that been like? Um, yeah. What has it been like the last few years being out and being able to participate? Yeah, I I, I recall um, the first time that I voted um, in my life was you know when, when I came back home, um, and 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 that meant that you know I missed being able to uh, vote in 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 a few historic elections. One of which you know was this country seeing its first elected um, black president. Um, I didn't have the opportunity because I was incarcerated and, 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 and nobody should be deprived of voting. Um, but what, what that experience was like for me, um, it, was, it was me being part of the larger society. It's, it's, it's like me engaging in my civic responsibility, me caring about the conditions and quality of my life um, and, and, and being able to express that through, through my my having cast a ballot and so it was a it, it was a great experience um kind of kind of like along not even kind of i don't want to minimize it um you know there are there are times where you know i sit and i reflect back on we speak about you know derek derek washington um and the mission the Appearance mission initiative and you know we, we speak about uh the ability to vote and the, thir the 13th amendment and so you know, for me, being able to vote is kind of like taking myself from a position of you know slavery, and 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 coming all the way through and 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 getting my freedom, and finally being able to cast to cast a ballot, you know, so that I can have a say so about the condition that I just came came from, and so you know, voting voting is just that important to me. Thank you, Sean. Um, yeah, I totally resonate with that, and and really. Um... Yeah, I appreciate your your candid and your vulnerability talking about that. So thank you, um, and I and I hope you'll stick around for a little bit to engage in a little more conversation. Um, you know, Pastor Hobbs and, and Justin have been instrumental in, in organizing um, with this with this campaign and and um, campaigns in the past with the Mass Power um, ballot initiative. Um, and I'd just love to hear a little bit about some of the things, um, Justin, that you ran into in, in Western Mass with some struggles and, and, and uh, Pastor Hobbs, maybe some of the things you, you saw, um, some of the, maybe some of the difficulties we'll start with, and um, then we can talk about some of the wins and some of the, um, the positives that came out of your experience this past fall. Again, thank you um, for the opportunity to be a part of this panel. I'm so humbled and excited about um, the work that we're going to do moving forward. Um, so uh, some of the challenges have been um, being able to, um, let me see, quite candidly, it, 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 let me just be, it has been some of the gatekeepers, right? So the notion that um, there are experts and um, in fact, it's interesting when uh, we were going into the Boston Elections Department and we were bringing in the mail-in voter registration forms as well as the absentee ballot applications, one of the representatives at the um, Elections Department, um, Rakia Edwards, she noted on the back of the absentee ballot application that it said the special accommodation for uh, those who are incarcerated, they didn't even, they don't even need to register to vote. They could participate via absentee ballot. And we raised that to the commissioner at that time, who was Dion Irish. And um, he said, you know what, I've never even seen that because it's in the small print. Um, and he said, let me look into this more and I'll get back to you. And he came back and said, you know what, you're absolutely right. And came on Boston Page Radio TV Network and said that this in fact is the reality. Um, and so 
Um, we tried to tell other folks who were kind of gatekeepers with who the ex experts, and they're like, "That's absolutely not true." Um, so that has that was that was discouraging. But we just stayed the course, and again, um, continue to do what we um, to continue to um, um, bring in the absentee ballot applications. And I think this the win was that the coalition we were connected via. In fact, it was um, Minister Priscilla Flint Banks who is tuned in via the Black Economic Justice, and she had on her broadcast Rasan Hall from the ACLU who um, said, let me connect you to Common Cause. They're doing some great work. And so uh, it really was huge to be able to then have the support of Common Cause to push the work that we were doing specifically at the Suffolk County House of Correction. Um, and as you said, uh, Christina said earlier, then to be able to have the Secretary of State, as we had a letter posed and they had a letter and we were get together able to get the letter and have our folks who were already signing on to it to complement that letter to be able to get that success of the Secretary of State to then be able to issue that guidance to say that, yes, this in fact is the case. Um, so um, I think the other challenge has been just being persistent and being able to have access to be able to go in. We've got to be, be really, um, we've had to be persistent to go to the director of social services and they've had a lot of turnover um, to be able to um, kind of continue to build momentum in the gains of really trying to build this infrastructure um, within the Suffolk County House of Correction. Um, and so um, the, the, the good thing is that Sheriff Thompson, I really have to lift him up as he's allowed us to be able to um, come in even during COVID. Um, and as a result of that, we, um, and he actually has committed to actually this ballot initiative that we uh, learned from, I'm part of something called Citizens United for the Rehabilitation of Errands and International Movement. And that's where I met a gentleman, Charles Thornton from Washington, DC, who is a returning citizen. Who, created, who was instrumental in creating the Office of Returning Citizens model. And, um, and so he will, again, I get my guidance from folks who are been incarcerated, Eric Kennedy and so forth. And um, he was able to help us to understand what they were doing, voting inside Washington, DC. And again, advocacy from returning citizens, he was able to help us to come up with this initiative, ballot box initiative. Even during COVID, we know this law that was passed so that people didn't have to put themselves at risk they were able to get, um, those who were registered were able to be mailed a ballot to their home. Um, and unfortunately we know that returning citizens, obviously they're not gonna get, if they, if they were registered, they're not gonna forward it to their house of correction. They don't even know that they're there. Um, so we were, he came up with this initiative that the sheriffs communicate their roster, those who are waiting pre-trial, those who are serving misdemeanors to be able to communicate that roster to the board of elections and the board of elections then actually create ballots, never mind an application, just because again, they're specially qualified with an absentee ballot. So just submit the ballot, the absentee ballot in a locked ballot box and have a municipal officer drive that to Nashua County Jail, as well as the Suffolk County House of Correction, have it delivered to their respective cells, i.e. to our homes. And then they collect them, put them in a locked ballot, ballot box as everybody else has the opportunity to cast their ballot and that on the election day to be driven to the Board of Elections, it's a locked box and that would be able to be a model. And Sheriff Tompkins has signed on to this. And so we're excited that um, hopefully he's gonna follow through. We didn't, we weren't able to do it for the presidential election, but we know we have a mayoral election coming up. And so he's committed to doing that. So we're hopeful this ballot box initiative will happen for Suffolk County House Correction, Nashua County Jail, and be a model that can be replicated throughout the Commonwealth. Thanks, Pastor Hobbs. Um, that was really insightful. And one of the things that you brought up was um, the difficulty that folks on the outside had accessing and navigating resources and who held what information and where to get what information. And I just think about what it was like behind the wall and like how difficult it is for folks on the outside to be able to navigate that like and we want the idea is being presented that like ballot access is available and like if you can't access like the clear lines outside like it's nearly impossible um inside so i really appreciate you highlighting that um justin do you want to talk a little bit about what it was like in western mass and some of the barriers that um you all faced out here yeah definitely and yeah i just want to say also to start um feel very honored to be on this panel and grateful to be 
in this work with you all. And before I forget too, I want to shout out um, Ellie and Rachel Corey, who are, I see on the chat, um, who did a lot of this work the last round, um, as well as Derek Washington and folks inside. Um, and then there's a lot more volunteers um, who I think might be out there, um, but I can't see because of the format. But um, so I say, yeah. And, and I think on that point too, or building off that Katie, I think the first thing is like one um, barrier is ideally I wouldn't be the person speaking right now. I would have much preferred, um, I think it'd be important and better and, and maybe as a goal going forward for someone who's currently incarcerated um, to be calling and to speak to their experience of voting. And, and I think that also connects to one of the barriers being um, just a really frustrating lack of cooperation with sheriffs um, in Western Mass um, that I can speak to specifically. And, and um, yeah, on the one in terms of coordinating with people inside um, who are trying to vote um, or who did vote and um, is a point to work towards is, is people voted and, and we reached out and it would have been great to have people inside be able to speak directly to their experiences. Um, but I can say from the outside, um, one of the big barriers um, was, was one just information and um, a lack of public information for who's eligible to vote, who's currently incarcerated already. Um, never mind like working towards um, Reenfranchisement for people convicted of felonies, but who's like already has a right to vote is not um, being reached, and and that's a large population in Massachusetts around the country, but um, pre-trial and people on a misdemeanor. So the first part is just like not even having those numbers publicly accessible easily to know um, who like, how many ballots we need um, was like one barrier to begin with, um, and then. Yeah, and then and then sort of a lot of the, the issues that Pastor Hobbs already named. Um, um, in addition to that, just the um, the barriers of like filling out forms and getting those in and getting those approved by town clerks um, was a lot of back and forth for volunteers because I, I don't know if like folks on the outside tried registering for a mail-in ballot, but. Uh, it's very easy to um, not fill in something correctly or to miss a box. And, and that back and forth takes time and that's multiplied um, with the jail and then um, having to navigate uh, the bureaucracies of multiple institutions of jails and town clerks and elections registration. So ideally in the, in the future, having those happening at the same place, like having registration happen inside, so you're talking about having voting happening inside and cutting out the um, all these multiple barriers that happen within jails, but also just within uh, black and brown communities, within working class communities. It's very discouraging um, and yeah, alienating, like navigating um, paperwork in general and offices and offices that aren't necessarily friendly um, or very hostile honestly, to, to folks who are incarcerated or formerly. Um, so those are some of the barriers. Um, and, and also within that, like, too, I want to, like, shout out um, Jenny Abels, who's on the call, who's the education coordinator at the Greenfield Jail, and to name that there were also allies, um, folks working with us, too, um, to help navigate, help um, get people registered. And, and in, um, in the Greenfield Jail case, like, going beyond that, too, and doing um, voter education, um, having um, like meetings, like talking about like what's up, what's on the ballot, um, about the right to vote, and doing that kind of work that is important because like one like access to vote is already a fight, but then um, people knowing that they have the right to vote, um, people knowing like what voting, what they what they have the right to vote about, um, is huge too. So there's. I know it's just like so many layers to it and um, was encouraging to see some of that coming together um, this year, but then also really discouraging. So in the case of like the Berkshire County Jail um, took a lot of pushing um, and did not get much of a response, mailed a lot of material, followed up, unclear both how many people could vote um, and, and, and yeah, let alone like how many people were successfully able to vote. And so I think that's been a huge barrier. It's just like a lack of public information um, for us to even start with, then navigating the barriers to making it happen. 
Thanks, Justin. Um, Pastor Hobbs, um, do you want to talk a little bit about um, successes um, in particular that y'all saw this this fall? Um, do you know how many folks you, that were able to access ballots? Um, you know, I know in Western Mass, that was something we struggled to, to find out numbers, but um, I don't know if it was a little better out in Eastern Mass finding out um, how many folks were actually um, able to access a ballot this year and, and maybe some of the relationships that were built um, that we're hoping to build off of moving forward with some other initiatives, um, uh, felony reenfranchisement and, and ending gerrymandering. Um, so yeah, if you wanna talk about any successes. Sure, sure. And um, actually, I, I want to mention one more barrier because um and, and success, and that is the barrier was being able to tease out those who are serving misdemeanors via the IT system and those who are waiting pre uh, uh, and those who are serving felonies, right? So so that so believe it or not, they were saying and they and if a person is serving a felony conviction and they vote, you have now incurred another felony. So obviously that's not something that we want to do, but the IT system, unfortunately, um, they were they were not able to tease out who, I mean, I'm sure they knew it, but their system couldn't tease it out that we could make sure that every single person who was serving a misdemeanor actually had the right. So sometimes they did kind of focus on just pre-trial um, just to make sure that we didn't get anybody. And that was a problem for us. So, and, and again, the director of social services contingent upon who that was, was more aggressive and being able to find that out, um, do, te te you know, do the work, do, do, do the detective work to tease it out. But now they are working to be able to do that, make sure that that actually, the IT department um, will be able to tease that out moving forward. So that's, that's um, a success. Um, I think the relationship with elected officials, quite candidly, state representative Nika Alugardo, city councilor at large, Huli Mejia, who won by one vote. Um, those are folks, and and as well as Andrea Campbell, who city council, who's running for mayor um, here. There, so more there's is a groundswell of other folks and now allies who are elected, um, as well as um, Sheriff Tompkins and his administration, whom are really committed to really being able to, again, create this ballot box initiative. And to me, that's huge um, because that will build, that will build this infrastructure that is in the, that, you know, that I think will really be able to build them. And he also had um, candidates forms for the district attorney, as we know the ACLU did for the district attorney, what a difference the DA makes. Um, and we were able to get our first woman and first a uh, woman of color who uh, extraordinary district attorney, Rachel Rollins, um, as a result of that, as well as for the senator's race, um, Ed Markey and, and Ted Kennedy, uh, um, they, that they were able to um, have, um, uh, do, that was during COVID, a, uh, a, electro, a Zoom candidates forum. Um, so yeah, those are some of the successes, I think, um, and as well as by candidly connecting with this whole coalition and some of this getting the power behind this coalition to really um, move forward the work at the Suffolk County and throughout the Commonwealth. Awesome, thank you, Pastor Hobbs. Um, you know, it's been mentioned a couple times um, throughout this this program tonight about felony um, disenfranchisement. And um, in Massachusetts, I think it was up until 2000, um, uh, folks incarcerated on felonies were able to vote. Um, there wasn't this um, difficulty around finding out who's eligible, who's not eligible, and 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 finding those numbers. And mm. and it was only 20 years ago, which is, still blows my mind. Um, but last year there was there was a um, and this there's been building on this for a while, and we continue to build on it. But last year there was a, a mass power movement to um, get a ballot question put out to reenfranchise folks that are incarcerated on felonies. And I didn't know if anyone wanted to talk. About about that, Sean, if, if you had worked on it or um, talk about the folks that um, you know that did work on it um, and yeah. Yeah, um, as, a, as a matter of fact, um, if I recall correctly, I, I was in touch with um, some of the work that Rachel Corey was doing, um, you know, in conjunction or on behalf of the Emancipation, the Emancipation Initiative um, where, you know, we went out into the community and uh, gathered signatures to uh, try to get it on the ballot. Um, that, you know, that was definitely 
something that was near and dear uh, to me, you know, having once been deprived of the opportunity to vote. Um, you know, and I look forward to, um, um, you know, in the future, just helping to raise the awareness um, of, 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 of just the average people. Um, because that's one thing that, you know, was, you know, figured out um, while we was gaining signatures that, you know, there needed to be a lot of education going on. Um, and so, you know, I look, I look forward to continuing to be involved in that. Thank you, Sean. Um, does anybody else want to talk a little bit about um, the mass power um, and the, the reenfranchisement of, <clears throat> um, of those incarcerated on felonies? Um, if, yeah, so if you want to talk a little bit about it, that'd be dope. Um, sure. Yeah, yeah, and, and I was part of that campaign last year and, and I'll say it was, um, yeah, I totally agree. The, um, even just like the, the education around like what the right, what rights exist already um, is so important and we're starting so far behind because of so much misinformation or lack of information. Um, but then, yeah, having those conversations about shifting um, the, yeah, like power of folks inside to become a voting block um, and like what that could mean um, for people who's, yeah, who are coming out and from the, yeah, experiences of being inside informing political decisions and voting choices was huge. And those conversations um, for me were really inspiring and, and moving me and, and also was encouraging just talking with folks outside who hadn't thought of this ever before um, becoming outraged that this wasn't already the case. And um, so feeling like that was encouraging last year and then having more conversations this year um, around voting in jails um, for all the like barriers and everything that we're up against. Um, just talking to people and, and like feeling more and more um, people like wanting to get involved and um, like feeling deeply and caring about this. And yeah, and ha like this year having the problem of like too many volunteers and like not enough things for them to do. Or it's like, we want to get inside. We're not allowed inside. We're like trying to figure out like what, what, what else can we do while we're like waiting? And I feel like that's like the, like a great problem. Um, and feels encouraging for, yeah, for this next round and for, nice. Sorry, just reading the chat at the same time for like these next steps that um, there is, yeah, groundswell, more people learning, more people getting involved and do a large part to a lot of the work of folks on this call. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I can't tell whether Pastor Hobbs frozen or not, whether he was about to say anything. We're good though. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm really curious and, and Sean, this is super directed towards you um, with, with this movement, this groundswell that's happening um, across the state outside, um, how can we like how can we support folks on the inside um, with access to um, education, with um, organizing efforts? Like, what what base what best ways can we um, organ support the work that's already being done inside and lift that up? Um, yeah, so so it is really. The best way to support them is, you know, one, um, which I think, you know, there are people that's doing this and it's not forgetting about them. Um, you know, the, the minute that we allow for a complete disconnect to happen between us out, us out here, us on the outside and those on the in, inside, the, the condition that, that they can that that they have to endure will intensify even more than what it already is. Um, and then, but two, is 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 people out here need to get by the the working in little silos, um, and, and there need to be a working a working unity, if you will. Uh, it's okay for everybody to not get along if people don't get along. Um, but those disputes shouldn't hinder um, the main objective, which is to, to give voice to those 
who are voiceless, you know? And once that happens, then, you know, we get to the point to where we can uh, 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 launch political capital to change the conditions that, you know, the people on the inside are fighting to address, uh, whether it's the right to vote, whether it's uh, um, the work being done to abolish life without parole, um, whatever the, the, the conditions are that's being addressed in there. Um, and it, it, it could be the separation of the prisoner and the prisoner's family. Um, because there is an attack on the relationship between the prisoner and not just the community, but the prisoner and his own family. Um, that's the, the, that's the, that being severely limited, being severely limited. And, and so, you know, the importance of the work and what can be done is to build and garner and gain and, and then levy the political capital um, against those who are elected in charge with the responsibility of overseeing uh, the, the, the Department of Correction. And we should also be talking about and entertaining the idea of the Department of Correction going back um, to, 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 to fall within the Department of Public Health rather than the Department of Public Safety, uh, because crime is, is a health problem, not a, just you know, so much a, 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 a public safety problem. Thank you, Sean. Um, yeah, the, a couple of things you said that super resonated. You know, making sure um, we stay in contact with our with our loved ones, our friends, our families, our brothers, our sisters, our mothers um, that are that are um, behind the wall and 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 listen, right? Like, give uplift their voices in in this process. And um, the the more that the distance between that, like the the more damage um, that does. So um, I really appreciate you lifting that up. Katie, um, if, if 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 I can add another dynamic, and I think it's extremely important, um, is that you know. People like Ricky McGee, um, people like Derek Washington, people like Mac Hudson, um, those are just a couple. Um, people like Alameen, um, those are just a couple of people <clears throat> who, who is doing this work on the inside. And as they're doing this work, they're being targeted and punished um, because they're trying to, to address, you know, um, gain them back the right to vote. Or, or, or expanding, you know, the utilization of the furlough policy, uh, the furlough program, and and so when they are punished, we need to we need to be following up with, um, uh, you know, the governor and the commissioner uh, and the secretary of public safety asking, you know, why are they why are they being targeted and punished and punished and punished now? Where before they started this work, they were just fine. And so, you know, I just wanted to add to add that to the conversation as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thanks for lifting that up. Because um, I think that's how the, the right to vote got taken in, in the first place. Um, guys were organizing. Guys were organizing their voices, organizing their power and um, and, the, and the power structure didn't like it. So thank you for lifting that up. Um, because that's something I know I saw a lot um, when we were working on the mass power campaign and, and over the year um, have definitely um, heard of a lot of cases. So I appreciate you lifting that up. Um, one thing that was mentioned um, through the last few months and, and something we'll be continuing to work on is, is um, uh, gerrymandering and, and prison gerrymandering. And, and I'll be totally honest, I don't know much about it. The word feels funny in my mouth. So I'm gonna let uh, Christina um, tell us a little bit about it um, and how it relates to this work and, and moving forward. Cool, thank you, Katie. Um, and and Thank you, Sean, especially for um, for everything that that you're you're uh, kind of offering to this conversation, and and I think especially for us as a coalition that really like this fall was quick and intense, and there's so much work to do. And part of what I think this moment is for between now and the next legislative session is coming back as a coalition and and just figuring out how we can do this work um, uh, better statewide. Um, so I know, yeah, we've gotten some questions about prison gerrymandering and that's, that's part of what our coalition is trying to address. You know, the problem in Massachusetts and other states is not just that incarcerated people either lose the right to vote um, by law when serving felony convictions in our state or, or face de facto disenfranchisement that our, our panelists have helped illustrate what that kind of can look like. Um, but it's that, that people in prisons are counted in the census 
um, in the community where they're incarcerated. That has the effect of bolstering political power, particularly for they tend to be white affluent suburban communities where prisons are and further stripping political power from primarily low income communities and communities of color. Um, you know, I, I just think, especially as we do this work, uh, and I know this fall, a lot of us have gotten in, in kind of the nitty gritty of, of voting in jail, but that fight is part of it too. 2021 is when uh, the, the redistricting process starts. If we pass legislation on prison gerrymandering this year, that would take effect in 2030 um, for the next redistricting process. Um, but, but that absolutely is part of our coalition's fight. And I know um, uh, the last redistricting cycle, I think it was Senator Chang Diaz filed legislation that would have redressed prison gerrymandering here. Um, that absolutely needs to be a priority again, so that that we are building holistic systems that that ensure that that the political power in in our incarcerated communities um, and 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 communities of color and low income communities are actually represented um, uh, in in the people who and and policies that govern us. Um, and I would also just ping kind of getting involved in the redistricting process as another way. Um, to think about and engage on uh, building and protecting political power for our communities. Thanks, Christina. Thanks for explaining that a little bit, because um, I definitely, it's like a word way out here, um, but I know it's so important. Um, I want to give um, our panelists an option to, you know, the opportunity to say any last words, um, but also with that, ask you not to go anywhere um, because there is a question and answer portion, but um, if you wanted to just close out with anything at this, um, at this portion. I guess I, I just really want to, again, um, thank you all and particularly Sean again, so humbled. And I want to acknowledge Minister Priscilla Flint Banks from the Black Economic Justice Institute and Kenneth Moore from Baltimore, Maryland and the, um, their commitment to um, one of the past, but moving forward, I, I'm really very um, excited about um, where we're going. Thank you, Pastor Hobbs. Yeah, just um, yeah, grateful for all the, the work that has got us to this point and looking forward to um, yeah, continuing to fight with you all um, for the long haul for this. And thank you. And I just, you know, would like to uh, you know, say how honored that I am to have been part of this panel and, and, and thank you again, you know, to everybody I send the attendance and I look forward to helping out in any way that I can to help raise up and push and push the issue. Um, because I think as, you know, we look at um, gerrymandering, we need, you know, that's all part of the gentrification too. And so, you know, it's all relevant. And so, you know, I definitely want to say thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Pastor Hobbs and Justin and, and Sean. Really, really appreciate um, you being with us on the panel tonight. Um, I'm gonna shift to Taniqua Hines, um, who's amazing. I love Taniqua. Um, uh, she's the racial justice uh, community advocate for the ACLU. Um, Taniqua is gonna talk a little bit about what, what, what the plan is, what do we do now, right? Like we've worked um, the past couple of years um, on, on voter voting rights. Um, this past, past fall, we did the um, election protection um, coalition. Now what, how do we move forward? So um, please help me welcome Taniqua. <laughs> Hi, oh, thank you, oh, claps. Thank you. Um, uh, like Kay said, I'm Taniqua and I'm proud to be representing the ACLU on this coalition. Uh, Christina, could you share the image please so I uh, explain the next steps? Cool, all right, so while Christina goes to doing that, I'll talk a little bit more about what's to come, right? So we talked a lot about the successes as well as challenges that happened. And understandably, there's a lot of systems to be working through in order for us to really achieve our ultimate goal to end disenfranchisement of folks who are incarcerated and protect the political power for over-policed communities. Because let's be real, the people who are the most impacted are people of color, immigrants, low-income folks who are criminalized for their identities, right? 
So what we're trying to do moving forward is really think of it as a three-step process. One, looking at the next leg legislative session as an opportunity to pass legislation to ensure meaningful ballot access for folks who are held pretrial and on misdemeanors. And these are the folks who are currently incarcerated and eligible to vote. And looking into next year as well, into 2021, really thinking about local municipal elections such as city councilors and mayors. And oftentimes we talk about how change really happens on a local level, and it does in this instance. These are folks who can really ease access to the ballot for folks who are incarcerated. And so we really need to organize around holding these folks accountable in order to improve access. And speaking about accountability, when we think about 2022, something that's coming up that's really important is sheriff's races. Someone brought this up in the chat, but oftentimes we don't think about how sheriffs are elected because they don't act as if they're elected. They act in the shadows. However, they influence so much of folks who are incarcerated in their lives. I oftentimes think about the carceral system in different ways. And in terms of the folks who influence that, I think of police as the people who are quote unquote, doing the field work, right? Policing these communities on the ground, so to speak. And then district attorneys, they're the folks who are prosecuting folks, who are charging folks and sentencing them to long sentencing and so forth. And sheriffs, these are the folks who really do supervise prisons and who really do influence the livelihoods of folks who are incarcerated and henceforth also influence their voting access, right? So we need to think about how can we hold these folks accountable as they're elected to us, right? We are, they, we elect them, right? Um, and they're elected countywide. And we see the ways in which the lack of transparency and accountability has acted out. Um, COVID is currently running rampant in jails across the country, including here in Massachusetts. And that's not something that's often talked about. Justin and others are doing really great work with Decarcerate Massachusetts as they try to uplift this work. And we saw something earlier this week when the attorney generals came out with a report on the Bristol County Sheriff and how they've been using excessive force against undocumented poor, undocumented immigrants who are held in ICE detention under his supervision. So increasing transparency is really important to improving the lives of incarcerating folks, including expanding voting access, as well as their health and safety when we think about COVID. You know, the COVID vaccine has recently come out and um, according to the phases that are happening in Massachusetts, incarcerated people are amongst the first to get it. However, like sheriffs and other elected officials have not been on the forefront of making sure that these folks are protected in terms of public health and public safety, which I think also ties into what Sean was saying er earlier about how public health really ties into all this. Um, and we're hoping that through this work um, that we can really lay the foundation for public education to ultimately end felony disenfranchisement everyone deserves the right to vote. And with this work, we believe that Massachusetts can and should be a state to lead on this issue. Nicole really opened up really well talking about the national landscape, but we here in Massachusetts, although it's you know thought of us being very liberal, we can really move forward on, on this issue and make sure that um, folks have this political power and that we're holding folks and the systems accountable to make sure that we're protecting the most and empowering the most marginalized. Thank you. Aniqua, thank you. Um, I just think about like the next four years and all I can say is like, let's get it, let's get it done. Like, let's make it happen. Um, I'm all about it. Um, and, I, and I just wanna let folks know that this is like the first of, of more events to, to um, happen. Um, you know, stay tuned in your emails and, and um, coalition work because um, we'd love to, to hold space uh, moving forward to have more conversations about how we can work together. Um, but we do have a few minutes um, before our, our end time. Um, if folks have some questions uh, for our panelists, um, or Taniqua or Christina. Um, I saw that we had a question, um, uh, maybe for Justin, uh, on not an unrelated, slightly different topic on what will be what's going on in Western Massachusetts on the policing bill. Um, I don't know if you want to weigh in on that. Um, and I'll also just flag that if we have questions that we don't get to, uh, uh, we can answer them after. And as Katie said, this is the first of um, of much to come. Yeah, that's great. I was just typing in a response to that. Um, please uh, email, tweet, uh, call. 
your legislators have all of them um, and get them to support a um, override of uh, Governor Baker's veto um, to get that racial justice policing bill passed. It's not, it's already watered down. It's not great, but it's good. It's better than what we have now. Um, so it just requires, yeah, um, pushing them um, and getting yeah more people to push them. I wish I had like a, a clear, more direct um, answer for how to solve it. Um, but there's a lot, just general pushing to do right now and in the near future. Um, and I also just wanted to second and appreciate Sean, your um, comment about moving um, DOC um, under um, public health and, and both for the public health issue that incarceration poses in general, um, and also for the general like lack of accountability and oversight um, of both the DOC and of the jails um, that not having, yeah, having like the lack of transparency and, and, and anything to like whatever wins we have, um, we make making sure that those actually happen, um, like needing a much bigger solutions um, beyond this. But yeah, I just wanted to, to second and appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. Um, I do want to highlight that Taniqua just put in the chat um, ways that you can plug in uh, for direct action around um, the policing bill. So go ahead and click on that link. Um, Christina, are there any other questions in the chat um, that we should throw out? You know, I think the only thing I saw that someone asked, um, even after this discussion about who can vote and who can't, the short in Massachusetts is only those folks serving felony convictions lose the right to vote, but people who are serving misdemeanors or held pretrial face systems of de facto disenfranchisement too. We're totally fighting to restore the right to vote for those serving felony convictions in some ways exactly because of that question. I know myself and, and everyone on this panel has had um, more conversations than we can count with people who say they haven't participated because they're worried that they don't have the right to vote. The fact is that felony disenfranchisement is confusing and has the effect of suppressing participation um, just on its face from those folks who, who are eligible. Um, so, you know, I think that that like actually answering, asking that question routinely um, uh, proves the point of why this matters. Um, um, otherwise, those were our questions. I know we're just about at the top of the hour. Um, and uh, I'll also, I'll put my email in the chat um, so we can keep the conversation going, but pass it back to um, Katie to close. Thanks, Christina. Um, Y'all, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I feel honored to be in this space with, with such amazing um, badass people doing some badass work that's needed. And, um, and I'm grateful and I'm, and I'm grateful that y'all are, are um, we're ready to go like full steam ahead over the next few years. Um, so thank you for, for um, joining us tonight. Thank you for taking the time to hear about um, this much needed work. Uh, Taniqua, Pastor Hobbs, Justin, Sean, Christina, and Nicole, who's no longer with us. Um, thank you so much for taking the time um, to share your experience and knowledge with us. Um, and yeah, stay tuned because this is just the first of many um, events and, and um, things that are going to be happening. So thanks, y'all, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone. I'm gonna uh, click end the meeting, but I'll see you all. I'm sure back on Zoom very soon. <laughs> Bye y'all. Good night everyone. Have a great holiday everybody. <laughs>